Hello there ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mildra, and I will be your Gaming Monk for the evening. I don't get as much time as I'd like to talk about anime, though I'm no slouch or fly-by-night type of otaku, I'd want to make that clear. They've provided a significant amount of inspiration for me over the years, and more than once my campaigns have taken subtle notes from these series. This brings us to Shonen Final Burst, a playing card based RPG that aims to emulate the likes of Naruto, Bleach, One Piece, and so on, in the form of tabletop gaming. Does it hold up? Or is it as derivative as critics have called the source material? Let's find out. At 193 pages, shown in Final Burst, hereafter referred to as SFB because I am not paid by the syllable, has a layout and writing that's a breeze to go through, and it wears its genre savviness on its sleeve, which is definitely its most endearing aspect. It's certainly light on anything flashy, but the artwork comes off as a bit too chibi for my taste. It's still good art, but I'm not sure it completely fits. On the plus side, it's got an index. Character creation is an aspect-centric method, in a sense. We'll be exploring that with a psychic swordsman named Mirai. The first step is archetype, a broad categorization that's the closest thing to a class in this game. This grants its own unique ability. In this case, we'll go with the big guy as the archetype. This grants us a defense bonus against attacks based on the damage threshold that we're in. We'll get into what damage thresholds are later. Second is attributes. SFB has five of them that represent different forms of fighting, each starting at one. You have 50 points to spend between them, and no attribute can exceed 20. With that in mind, Mirai's attributes are Strength 20, Speed 2, Mind 20, Skill 3, and Energy 5. Third is Combat Style, where you determine the attributes you can test against with yours in an X versus Y format. This may seem odd, but remember each attribute is a form of combat in and of itself, not the typical ability score. For Mirai's Combat Style, we'll go with the following. Strength versus Speed. Speed versus skill, mind versus energy, skill versus strength, and energy versus mind. Fourth is techniques. Techniques in SFB are power sets of a sort, a grouping of abilities that represent what you can do. These are split between active and passive techniques. Now we choose three active techniques and one passive technique, each representing a different suit, as we'll see later. These start at rank 1, and we distribute 7 points between each. Additionally, the active techniques have an associated suit, as I mentioned before, between hearts, clubs, and diamonds, with the passive assigned to spades. Taking this into account, our active techniques are Super Strength 3, Mega Mind 3, and Illusion 2. These are assigned to hearts, clubs, and diamonds, respectively. Our passive technique is Weapon Master 3. This choice in techniques makes Mirai's power-up score to be 1 and his aura to be 4. Again, we'll get to these later. Fifth is Signature Moves, the big extensions of a character's techniques. We'll start out with two of them that are built from an attribute, technique, and option. So Mirai's two techniques are what we'll call Critical Blade and Bulwark Mind. The first, Critical Blade, uses the Strength-based and the Mega Mind technique with the exploit effect. It also has the Lingering Effect option to make cripples last longer. The second, Bulwark Mind, uses the Mind Base, the Super Strength technique with the Endure effect. In addition, it has the Shielding Blast option. Sixth is Transformation. After all, most shounen anime characters use some sort of advanced form, and SFB emulates this through transformations. At character creation, you may choose between having one, two, or three forms, with 5, 4, and 3 stages of power, respectively. These are unlocked as you progress along your techniques. Since we only have one transformation unlocked, we'll focus on the Stage 1 version. This grants the inherent bonuses 1 Amazing Attribute and 2 bonuses. For the first attribute, we'll go with Amazing Strength. and For the other options, we'll go with Amazing Mind and Advanced Combo Flow for Super Strength. Seventh is Gimmicks, which help add role-playing quirks to your character. We may start with two gimmicks, but can only feature one of them. In other words, equip it. We'll go with Three Wolf Sword and Tactical Genius. 
taking the former at the start. The final step is allies and hobbies. Allies provide one-shot powers to assist you in the form of NPCs or another PCs. For the purposes of this, we'll go with solely with two NPC ally powers. In this case, it'll be healing and suit search, both ranked at 1. Hobbies, on the other hand, are the game's equivalent to skills in other games. We spend three points from the hobbies linked to our archetype. In our case, we'll go with two in comfort and one in inspire. And we also gain two self-explanatory action hobbies. In this case, craft and exercise. Character creation is fine, if a little book jumping. The only real issue I had is the ally system. Being a bit more dependent on the whole party being present instead of developing individuals, which is how I normally do this. That said, the material is still broad enough to easily reskin the style of shonen that you'd wish to go with. I'd only say some of the gimmicks could stand to be less specific, but there's nothing a few house rules or some hacking can't fix. All in all, a good use of the genre it seeks to emulate. As was hinted at in character creation, SFB uses a playing card system instead of dice rolls. This is split into three forms, the player deck, the game deck, and the boss deck. These decks are built differently, with the player's and game's deck having no face cards, and the boss deck being composed of nothing but face cards. The bulk of the system's detail is in combat, so that's where we'll focus. At the start of combat, all participants draw five cards from their own deck, and an appropriate number of cards from the game deck. Hands are revealed simultaneously, with attack results being rooted in sequential cards, while blocks use matching cards. This is where combat styles come into play, as it determines the attribute that the card play will modify. In Mirai's case, as an example, consider if he had made a strength attack with a hand that combines a 3, a 4, and a 5. This would make his final attack to be 32, which is reduced by the final modified speed, as that's what he's contesting against. Any leftover difference is added to the target's damage track. When taking damage, this is counted upward on the track instead of downward, with each threshold offering the opportunity to gain power tokens for transformations and signature techniques, as well as additional cards from the game deck. Further modifying this is Power Up and Aura, a means to bank unused cards for signature moves and transformations. The former value, Power Up, determines how many cards per turn can be powered up, with Aura being the cap of powered up cards. That's just the core, obviously. Other aspects are allies providing a one-time bonus to encounters, hobbies providing for pre-battle advantages, and team-up attacks and techniques. Once again, I'm reminded of the craftwork system that used Cthulhu Tech, and in a way, it makes the same mistake. By focusing on sequential and matching sets, it results in a setup that can be very swinging. More importantly, I don't quite know how I feel about the way power tokens are used. Gaining them at certain thresholds certainly fits the trope of shonen characters getting stronger with more damage, but I feel it's too conservative for the genre it's emulating. I get the intent of having players try and save them up, but experience has shown me that players will easily overcompensate on saving tokens for a raining day, even if it's already pouring hard harder than monsoon season. Not helping matters is the fact that transformations and signatures require aura and power tokens, the latter requiring an upkeep of them as well. I think making this a little less restrictive would go a long way towards encouraging players and GMs to use their full repertoire. Games that emulate a genre are always going to have to operate under the assumption that the players have some familiarity with the source material. Granted, a genre like shonen anime is going to be an easier sell than some other genres I can think of, but there's no getting around the fact that most of the game is going to be centered around combat. Thankfully, the game does not make apologies for that focus. After all, if you're playing this game, you're going to have a passing familiarity with the likes of Dragon Ball, Bleach, and so on. Using cards instead of dice is a bold move, but I think it handles it well through its technique system and the customizable forms of kit. Its main drawback is being a little too random for its own good, and not having too much of a vice grip on the ability pool during its combat. SFB assumes that this is for the purposes of storing them over time, but I feel this is a bandage over the two-headed monster of being too random and too confined for what it wants to be. That in no way is to say that the game is bad, rather that it's something that could use a few small tweaks to reach its full potential. Thus, I feel confident in giving the game a stamp of recommended. If you're an anime fan looking to bring some of that flavor to the table, then it's most definitely a strongly recommended. 
The system has a good balance of customization without overwhelming, but I'd recommend house ruling a little to keep things from dragging too much. I would not recommend screaming for 20 minutes per session during play, especially if the GM has to manage multiple combatants. Genre emulation can only get so far.